Hi and welcome to this video, possibly these videos, depending on whether this is uh, going to be in one or two as of yet. I don't know because I'm just starting to film it. The thing I want to address first and foremost, however, is why have I titled this Secure a Breitling Chronograph Service? Well, let me tell you. There are two reasons for this. The first one, and most important, is just out of sheer fun. I wanted to see how many people would jump straight into the comments section without actually looking at the video and sort of frantically type, there's no such thing as a Secura Breitling, uh, just, just for the comedy value of it really. So um, thank you for those who have already. Um, obviously nobody has already because I'm just filming this, but as at the time of you watching this. And um, let's address that, Secura Breitling. Now this is something you'll have seen. If you have gotten into watches over the last few years and you've been looking around auction sites and the like and you've been looking for watches and what have you, you will have seen several watches advertised as Secura Breitling. What does that mean? In a nutshell, the Secura Breitling history goes thus. Secura was founded in 1939 and existed up until 1993. Breitling was founded in 1884, as you will see proudly emblazoned on the dial of pretty much any Breitling watch, like the Super Avenger here. And obviously, that being said, were around an awful lot longer than Secura as a brand were. However, during the quartz crisis, Breitling were one of the many Swiss mechanical watch manufacturers that suffered and felt the pinch and had to cease trading by um, September of 1978. They did so and laid off the remaining staff and then the remaining assets of the Breitling Corporation were sold off. The partially completed timepieces were sold off to a company called Zinn, who you will have heard of, that's S-I-N-N. And the tooling machinery and components were sold to a company called Olek and Weiss. Olek and Weiss is perhaps not so well known, but if you look back at my watch history, you will see a service on a beautiful Olek and Weiss chronograph in there. And they made very, very nice watches. So what was left was the name in essence. And Mr. Schneider in 1979 made um, a deal with the Breitling Corporation to buy the rights to the name Breitling and Navitimer, both of which were very important pivotal names within the Breitling Corporation. Under this naming, uh, the Secura Corporation were able to breathe new life into the Breitling designs of old, create new designs and move forward with a second brand. This actually proved to be so successful and the Breitling watches that were being made and currently so far as today are getting better and better and better in quality. And the quality, for example, of this Super Avenger is just incredible, I can tell you. And it was so successful that in November 1993, they officially changed the name Montre Secura to Breitling. So it became, uh, Secura effectively became Breitling. So although they didn't have the original um, movements and such from Breitling, they did have the rights to the name and, uh, and to the name of the Navitimer. This meant that they could redesign and recreate the iconic timepiece, the Navitimer, but they could also expand out and create a whole range of new stuff. And the Breitling range, if you look at the pre-70s range of available watches from Breitling, and then look at the ones available from the sort of late 80s, early 90s onwards, you'll see a huge, huge array of them. The question remains, is there such a thing as a secure Breitling? The answer is sort of yes and no, but mainly no, because if you see a watch that says secure on the dial, it is not a Breitling. It has never been a Breitling and it never will be a Breitling. If you see a watch that says just a Breitling on the dial and it's post 1979, it is a Breitling made under the ownership of the Secura watch company. 
but it is still a Breitling because it is that's what it's manufactured as. Um, it would be like, for example, uh, Ford buying out the Porsche car company, but still producing iconic Porsche designs in its dedicated factory. It would still be a Porsche, it just would not be under the ownership of the previous owners. Same principle. So the, the two exist in, independently. So why do we see this name so often? It's one simple reason, and that is to generate sales because if somebody sees a watch with a cheap pin palette movement and believes that there is a link between Secura and Breitling that makes the Secura a better watch than it is as it were then people will tend to pay more of a premium for them and you can see the evidence of this because I have here this uh, Tegroff, I believe it's branded, which is also, again, another sort of take on the Pogue, on the 6139 speed timer, as you can see. This is currently in bits, but it has the yellow sunburst dial and it has the same chronograph layout. It uses the same movement, uh, pin palette EB8420, 17 joule movement, uh, cheap, robust and technically a bit of a throwaway movement. It was never built with the intention of lasting many, many, many years. Um, unlike high, much higher end movements, which were built in such a manner that they could be repaired, rejeweled and so on. So that is why Secura Breitlings exist. Uh, although they don't exist in reality, they definitely exist on eBay because people will typically pay a little bit more money for them. So there's a little bit of history for you. And without further ado, let's get into uncasing this watch and we'll start to strip it down. We've got a very nice solid screw down case back. And this is another area where many of the others differ. Uh, a lot have snap-on case backs. Some of them, some others, however, like this Tegroff, also have a screw-down case back, as you can see there. And um, underneath this case back, if we remove it, it's very thick steel, incidentally, and it's stamped with the uh, with the uh, Secura logo. And inside this is this adorable little beast that powers it. And I really, really like these movements. These are something of an underdog in terms of um, chronograph movements. A lot of people say that they're rubbish and I think that's unfair. They're not, they're not rubbish. They were a movement that was built for a purpose and uh, at a time when cost of manufacture was a very important thing. And it also enabled a lot of people to get a mechanical chronograph on their wrist for much, much less than some of the uh, better known chronographs of the day would cost. It's very rudimentary in design and in function. But it does work. It does what, it's, what it needs to do. It does what it says on the tin, effectively. It's a chronograph movement with a, a, central, a central sweep seconds and a 15 minute counter, which is a continuous drive counter. It doesn't tick over per minute. And the you can see here, you've got the center sweep seconds wheel there. You've got the intermediate wheel there, and then you've got the minute recorder there. So as this sweep seconds wheel moves and turns the seconds hand around, it also turns the minute recorder. So it's continuously moving. The operation of this is slightly different to most chronographs, uh, with the exception of one or two, where the start stop is actually on the bottom. So you press that and that engages the chronograph it can it uh, moves the um, the coupling clutch wheel with the extended wheel of the fourth pivot to drive the central 
seconds and that then drives the other hands around. You press it again to decouple it and here you can see if I just drive that around you can see how that interacts with the intermediate wheel and in turn with the minute recorder wheel and then the reset is what would be the usually the start stop button at the top like so and you press that in the main difference with this and most other chronographs is once you've started it you can only stop and then reset you cannot stop and then restart as you can see nothing happens there and nothing will happen until you've actually reset it if you watch this section up here this is where the hammer um, comes away it's, cur it's currently as you can see if I just try to gently move that you'll see that that jumps back that's because that's under hammer tension and that's holding that in place so if I press this you'll see that this moves out a little you'll see a bit pop up there and that's the hammers moving away and then the drive is engaged and that will turn and it will turn the chronograph when you press it again if you watch up here you'll see that that hammer moves out even further. This is on a two-stepped platform. So it has to remain, the hammer has to remain away from the hearts of the wheels or it would reset them as soon as you press the stop button. So rather than make a more complicated setup under here that would hold the hammers away while it disengaged the coupling clutch, it just moves them further away, which means when you go to restart it, it can't because it's already pushed those hammers right the way back and there's no means of actually re-engaging that, putting the hammers back and re-engaging the coupling clutch, if that makes sense. That probably sounded a little garbled, so apologies, um, but hopefully you understood what I meant there. And then of course, once you press the reset hammer, this pushes the hammer section, which you will see in greater detail shortly, that pushes it back, pushes the hammers down onto the hearts of the wheels, resetting them to zero, and also resets the engagement of the start-stop lever with the coupling clutch lever. So there you go, just a couple more times. So start-stop on the bottom and reset on the top. So I'll just demonstrate, we will move the second and minute recorder hands round a little so you can see that they're displaced you can't as you can see uh, just sorry uh, excuse the bezel there I've already popped that off in preparation for stripping the case but as you can see there you can't restart the chronograph nothing happens and when you press the reset button that pops your minute and your seconds recorder back to the zero position. So the first thing we need to do, having waffled at you for uh, what seems like an age, is to actually uncase this movement. I want to lift out the movement retaining ring. This is a thick molded plastic ring. This is actually a really good solid sturdy plastic ring. And as you can see, it's got the cutaways there for the pushers and for the crown and that is good quality stem in this one is held in with a screw down setting lever sometimes the setting levers on some of these movements are just on a pin and you usually have to unscrew them a little bit more and if it's on a pin you have to get something in and underneath the setting lever to lift it up. It's very tricky to see, but it's just down in here. Um, and with the with this type, you have to unscrew it quite away to allow the setting lever to lift enough that we can wiggle out the stem. This is probably the trickiest part of these movements. They uh, they don't come in and out as easily as many others. However, because the setting levers up here, up top as it were, rather than behind the dial, you don't have the same kind of risk and problem. There we go. As you can see that wiggles out. It's got a very, very wide lip there, as you can see, because there's quite a bit of slop in the fit of these and that's normal. That's, uh, that's, they're all like that, sir, as they say. 
and we can now after I've just blown this detritus which must have come from the case back um, sealing ring we can uh, uncase this little fellow like so really really nice style uh, this particular watch belonged to the owner's father and was owned by him from new and worn by him for many years so this is a um, this is a bit of a, a heirloom piece and uh, hopefully we're going to do him proud and get this running nicely and he will be able to enjoy it for many years and maybe even pass it down to his own kids so there's the case that will go aside for further cleaning later Having just put some cots on, I just wanted to show you in a little closer detail this setting lever and how it's all configured. And as you can see there, when I pull the stem out, it only has one position. Um, although saying that it does have a kind of quick set date, I'll, I'll show you that before we start taking the hands and everything off the dial. Um, but it does have a quick set date after a fashion. So. As you can see, you pull the stem out and you can see the setting lever move with it, like so. And this gives an idea of, of how the pinned ones, the ones that aren't held by a screw such as this here, can be um, prone to wear and a bit of slop in this slot here and why this slot is actually very deep. So just moving on to the dial side a moment to show you this. Ordinarily, I would never advise turning the hands the wrong way, or anti-clockwise as it were, to set the time. Let me just move that out of the way a moment so I can hold that and show you better. So you'd pull the stem out to the hand setting position and to change the time you would rotate, in this case you'd ro rotate the crown counterclockwise and that would rotate the hands clockwise. Rotate it 24 hours and it snaps over to the next day. However, with this one being a pin pallet, the risks are not quite as bad in turning this in the reverse direction as you would get with a conventional escapement, which has jewels, which could be easily damaged or chipped if you force the train in the opposite direction, as you do when you wind the hands backwards because of the friction on the cannon pinion. Now the friction on the cannon pinion of this watch and of many other pin pallets is actually supplied via a staked wheel which is on the mainspring barrel which again you'll see later but what happens when you turn this in the opposite direction is that your date advances rapidly so as you can see you can technically quick set the date by doing this so you can turn that to let's just say for example it's the 26th tomorrow so you turn that to the 25th and then start rotating your hands around this way and then let's say it's 11.30 so you would then turn it to 11.30 thereabouts and as it went over midnight click there you go is the 26th. So it's an interesting little feature. For those who aren't aware, who maybe have one of these movements, but did, didn't know that you could do that. Moving now on to the disassembly and the voiceover. As I find this easier to do than trying to talk as I'm uh, disassembling the movement. I have tried that on a couple of videos, but it's not always easy to do, especially when you're focusing on something. Um, First and foremost, I'm removing the center sweep chrono hand using a Presto tool. And in this case, I'm using the Presto tool because the hand sits very high above the dial. So with levers, it would require some kind of spacer fitting underneath uh, by the sides of the hands. The remainder of the hands are removed in the conventional way for me, which is hand levers, which I prefer over the Presto tools. And we're using a poly bag there to protect the dial as usual.
With the final hand removed, we go to the dial feet screws, shown here, pointing to it with the tip of my screwdriver. Uh, one is easily visible and accessible, the other one is accessed through the gap in the start-stop lever, which you'll see in a moment, and these are the top hat style, which are um, the tall headed screws with a skirt and they have a cut out on one side and the skirt cuts into the dial foot holding it secure. These are turned until the flat side is against the dial foot and then the dial is prized away from the movement. This one is a little awkward to come away, a little reluctant and that's because one of the dial feet is bent very very slightly outwards not so much that it's a problem it could have been like that from new it could have been from previously somebody previously removing the dial and pulling one side up a little bit further than the other a little unevenly um, but either way it wasn't really a problem and a very slight bend allowed that to be refitted very very easily but as with anything uh, patience and care is required in a situation like this with gentle levering around the areas where the dial feet are alternating side to side moving the dial out a little at a time until it frees. Underneath the dial is a spacer ring and that has two cutout points for the dial feet as you can see. This is refitted back to the dial and you can see there this normally just drops straight onto these dials and you can see how uh, the this is a bit of a tight fit in itself because again one of the feet is very, very slightly bent outwards. So the dial's popped aside and put somewhere safe and then we can move on to the movement. First thing I'm removing here is the balance. I like to get these out of the way early on and put aside so that they're safe uh, because of course the pivots and the hairsprings of these are quite fragile and easily damaged if not careful. There I'm just using an oiler which is a, a general purpose tool. I use that for many things. Uh, to lift the balance, ease the balance wheel out as I'm lifting the balance cock and uh, with these being a very low beat movement, 18,000 VPH you tend to find that the uh, balance springs are much thinner and weaker than uh, high beat movements. Now with the chronograph wheel retaining spring removed we can go ahead and remove the intermediate wheel, the minute recording wheel and the chronograph runner. On the chronograph runner is a very very tiny metal washer which acts like a bearing, a ruby uh, or a jewel uh, for the chronograph to rotate on. Some of the cheaper variants of the 8420 don't have this little washer, they just have a raised pip in the bridge itself which performs the same task essentially it just creates a raised surface to act as a bearing for the wheel to run on but there you can see the size of that is very very easily lost it's always sticks to either the main plate or the chronograph runner so be sure to check if you disassemble one of these uh, to see where it's stuck to because once it's gone through the cleaning machine it's so easy to lose that Next for removal is the chronograph bridge. This is held in place by two screws but also sits in a notch of a third screw which is one of the uh, train bridge, train and bar barrel bridge screws. So the two at either end are removed and then the plate can be lifted away and eased forward out of the slot like so. You can then lift away the start-stop lever. 
just showing here how that sits uh, this quite often just falls off when you remove the chronograph bridge as well so it's handy to see how it fits and there I'm demonstrating how the tension return spring fits it's a V shape so there we just removed the hammers and the stop lever which connects to the hammers this pivots on the tool post with the slot in which is the middle of the uh, balance um, sorry the um, the train and barrel bridge and then the coupling clutch which just lifts away and then we remove the driving gear on the extended fourth wheel pivot there is a special tool to do this job however I do like to use hand levers for it probably because I've just always done so and I'm used to doing it uh, but the presto tool is a very handy tool and ensures that you lever straight up minimizing the risk of bending an extended pivot so there we've just removed the pallet fork bridge very very tiny piece held by a single screw and the pallets are removed here we're removing the arbor for the mainspring barrel which is a simple pin and lifts out it's not retained in any way and there I'm just using a bit of Rodico to encourage the barrel out we next undo the three screws which hold the barrel and train bridge in place the third screw for this incidentally is actually the pallet cock uh, sorry the um, balance cock screw um, and that forms the third one and then the pallet cock screw is actually a separate screw so with the train bridge removed we can now remove the third second fourth and escape wheels and for a chronograph with a center seconds and a minute recorder this is actually a very very minimal and simple construction with those all out of the way we can remove the keyless works which are all on the top side of the plate as you can see here so the setting lever unscrews some of these have a setting lever which is held down by a spring plate on a screw and it's actually on a long pin but the principle is the same you just remove the screw lift away the plate or the setting lever in this case and then the yoke the sliding pinion the winding pinion and that's all the keyless works out of the way we then move on to the dial side and we have this what appears at first glance to be quite a complex array for the uh, the calendar mechanism but as you'll see in a moment once the securing screws are removed and the calendar wheel is lifted away the the plate with the works on is a single cassette type plate where everything is fixed in, in place, riveted in place and is designed to be a complete unit so this just simply lifts away as you can see there makes it nice and simple for reassembly and then under here we have the hour wheel the cannon pinion and the minute wheel the cannon pinion is a free cannon pinion and the um, friction for the train is provided by 
a wheel which is riveted to the main spring barrel. There I was just checking for play on the setting wheel which is riveted in place on the plate and if there is wear in that replacement is the only option. And here you can see the mainspring barrel, the, uh, the arbor with the tang is built into the lid as you can see. And then the pin or the arbor, the actual arbor as it were, is just a simple pin which sits through the middle. And then here we're just removing the mainspring which doesn't appear too bad but uh, but this was replaced as is standard practice for any movement that I tend to service and there uh, you can see the spring just escaped but it didn't get too far thankfully and this as you can see is a newer white metal uh, alloy mainspring but you can also see that it has some flex there, it doesn't sit flat which means it's most likely been wound into the barrel by hand and accordingly doesn't sit flat.